A huge thank you to everyone who's continued to support my work on Talk Beliefs. I now have a Patreon campaign where all contributions go towards the cost of travel, audio and video equipment, and fees to religious events that I fully intend to continue to infiltrate. Thank you. Sean, thank you very much for returning for the second part of this interview. Uh, we're going to look at Mormon missionaries and how to talk to them, how to challenge them from your perspective as an ex-Mormon who went on a two-year mission. So first of all, can you give us a brief recap of your mission and how your research into the history of the LDS Church uh, led to your deconversion? Sure. So just briefly, I was born and raised in the Mormon religion, and I worked as a voluntary missionary in Manchester, England for two years, uh, in 2007 to 2009. And later on, maybe six, seven years after leaving my mission, I went through a faith transition, which involved a period of intense research into LDS uh, Mormon history, into the the epistemological issues about how uh, the LDS Church makes truth claims, and into a variety of other subjects. And basically, to cut a long, very long story short, over a thousand hours of personal research, I basically came out uh, not believing anymore. And so I think this gives me a unique perspective at this time to offer ideas as to how you can speak with or deal with LDS missionaries, given that I was one and experienced that as a fully believing person and then came out and, and now disbelieve. So I can give you basically from end to end the full description of, of what it's like and what kinds of things make us think. That's going to be so cool. So um, as you said, for, so, you're, for someone who was a missionary, uh, who was really convinced of this Mormon message in his heart and mind, what would you say makes your average missionary tick? Uh, how do they view their mission? And, and indeed, how do they view the world that they're preaching to? Well, the first thing to realize, and I think this is not just for Mormons, but for many religious people, is that they sincerely believe what they claim to believe. Uh, it's not a facade or a pretense. So Mormon missionaries really do believe that the message they are out to deliver to mankind is the salvation of mankind and that only through this message can mankind truly be saved. So most missionaries sincerely and literally believe in the tenets of Mormonism. There are some missionaries who struggle with their beliefs and that can actually make it very difficult to be a missionary. Faith sort of carries one through a mission and when someone has a sort of lack of faith in those beliefs it can make it incredibly difficult and have a lot of cognitive dissonance. Um, Missionaries work full-time without being paid, so they don't live in the lap of luxury. Uh, often they live in modest apartments uh, in, in different countries. It's a tough life to be a missionary. It's a full-time thing. You, you don't do anything else, and there's a strict rule book about what you can and cannot do, which is interesting and detailed, but I won't really go into that at this time. And another thing to realize is that missionaries do uh, quite often uh, suffer from depression, I think especially in the beginning of their missions and when they're brand new. And similarly to that thought, brand new missionaries are not as molded as more mature missionaries are. And I'll speak a bit about that when we go into strategies with dealing with them. Okay, so after serving a mission yourself and then leaving the LDS Church, how do you feel about missionaries now? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I have mixed feelings about missionaries right now. My primary feeling about missionaries is empathy. I, I really feel sorry for them because I think that if, if you look into the LDS uh, doctrinal belief system, it can I think, I believe it's demonstrably false. So I think there's, uh, to, to, to put it in, in words that I've used before, I think they're trapped in a whirlpool of memes. That they're, they're stuck in this kind of system that is bigger and more complex than I think they understand. And I'm not, personally, I'm not upset or angry with missionaries. I know a lot of people are because they, in a sense, disturb the peace by knocking on people's doors and so on. But I mainly just feel sorry for them 
And I think the ideas they represent are simply false. And so I, I view this more, you know, to, to give a sort of reference to a lot of Sam Harris's type of discussions. I view this more of a, as a war of ideas and less so as, you know, a war against actual people. I see beliefs as something that someone has, not something they are. And so when I see missionaries, I feel like they've embraced ideas, often inadvertently. I mean, most of them are born into it. So I think they are victims of those ideas. And I think that the, the LDS Church organization in some ways can be considered abusive towards them, but not in overt ways, not like being physically assaulted, of course. So personally, I actually shy away from directly speaking with missionaries. Uh, I think at this stage of my life, even though I feel I've healed significantly from my journey, I still feel it's just a little bit too emotional for me to speak with missionaries. But that doesn't mean I don't have some, what I believe are very good ideas as to different ways you could approach a conversation with a missionary. Okay, so if a person is approached by more missionaries and just say you've had, I don't know, a really rotten day and you don't want to deal with any of that. So what's the best way to, how can I put it, get rid of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sure. I mean, missionaries come with varying degrees of pushiness, depending on their own personality, depending on their mission president, which is their ecclesiastical leader that presides over their local area, um, depending on the culture of their mission, either, uh, the, the, the companion or the, the person, the teammate that they're working with. So I think for the most part, if you just say the words, I mean, the words I heard most on my mission were, not interested and <laughs> if you just say not interested i think 90 95 percent of missionaries will respect that and simply leave you alone and they'll just bounce off and, and keep speaking with other people i do remember one time actually after my mission i i went attracting which is the name you know knocking on doors with some missionaries here in sydney where i live and we once knocked on a man's door and he just said another two words to us. He said, Fort Knox. And uh, I think I understood exactly what he meant by this. What was funny is that one of the missionaries that I was with, I'm South African, one of the missionaries I was with was from the US and had never heard of what Fort Knox was. So I didn't really understand uh, the reference. <laughs> but uh, you could try not interested or you want something a bit more sophisticated just express to them that you are Fort Knox. They will not penetrate through you. Okay. <laughs> so um, what if you feel you want to challenge Mormon missionaries, Sean? Uh, maybe have a little bit of fun with them. What could you do? Okay. Well, firstly, I think a decision that each individual should make is at what angle do you want to challenge them? Do you want to be a bit more direct, a bit more, you know, even antagonistic, if you wish, or do you want to be a bit more oblique and, and sort of kind and, and gentle? And in my opinion, <clears throat> I think both approaches have merit. And I think that uh, for, for, you know, I, I guess if you want to have an impact on, on their belief or help them to look into these kinds of things that, that I believe they should, then both approaches are actually valid and important. I think along that spectrum of which how direct you approach them i think all of those approaches are beneficial to them so i think first let's uh start off with the oblique approach which is what are the more gentle ways that you can approach a missionary and and in a sense in, in the in the language that we are using to benefit them and i think that the first one would be, and, and I want to refer again, we, we spoke briefly in our last interview about Stephen Hassan, the expert on cults. That's right. I want, yeah. To, yeah, I want to briefly mention his book, Combating Cult Mind Control, where he speaks about speaking of pre-cult identity. So for a missionary, often they have been born in the LDS church, which means they have no pre-cult identity. Again, see our previous video for terminology on whether or not Mormonism is a cult. But one thing that you can do is just speak with them about who they are. Try to help them identify their personality, their character, their interests. Many of those things are buried when you're a missionary as you're recreated in the image of Mormonism, in the image of a missionary. So 
you could say to them, I'm not interested in your message, but I am interested in you. Or you could just directly ask them without that preface, you could say, what, what are your hobbies? What hobbies do you have? Where are you from? Uh, do you have a boyfriend or girlfriend waiting for you? That's often a very touchy subject for missionaries. Um, do you, you know, what do you think of current events? Pokemon Go just came out. What, what impact has that had on you? You know, um, ask them what are their personal interests aside from Mormonism? What do they want to study when they get back home after their missions? And uh, do they like the country that they're in? If you're an England speaker with mission, do you like? What do you think of England? You know, welcome to England. Do you like it here? Those kinds of gentle conversations can be really helpful because missionaries often face a lot of just straightforward rejection and being kind to them can help them realize that the world or the, the painting of the world that they may have been painted, the world is not all that bad. There are a lot of nice people out there who are genuine and gentle. And that's one thing that was important for me to realize as a missionary. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I mean, I, I encounter a lot of Mormon missionaries myself and I do sort of pick up that they are, uh, yeah, a little bit lonely and a little bit, they sort of, yeah, I just want to talk to people occasionally, you know, but um, yeah. as you said, sometimes you do have to just challenge them directly. I mean, what are, what about these direct challenges? What's the, the benefits of doing that? Okay. Uh, before we speak about the direct ones, I have one more suggestion for indirect. Uh, that is missionaries often have certain allocated hours that they can give to community service. So when I was a missionary, I used to spend time, and I think for me personally, if I reflect on my missionary time, the most significant time that I spent was doing service, was actually helping people in ways that are not, not the way missionaries perceive helping them being saved, but helping them in a physical sense. So you could invite them to come to your home and do gardening. Really, they probably wouldn't turn that offer down. And for me, I met and made friends with some wonderful people when I was just doing their gardening as a missionary. And those relationships are dear and special to me. And I'm aware of another missionary who I worked with. He met a, a wonderful Buddhist man who said, I'm not interested in your message, but if you're willing to, I would love to work in my garden with you together. And he, he just loved gardening. And that kind of thing can be really touching and, and really uniting. You can build real friendships around that with missionaries. And for the most part, when they do service like that, they won't bring up their proselytizing efforts, again, depending on the culture of the, the, the mission zone in which they work. So right. there's another example. I mean, you could invite them to paint an old cemetery or pick up trash with you or do gardening and so on. And this can really touch them and, and help to build friendships with them. But you, you still think that perhaps challenging them directly on, say, doctrine and things is, is a good idea? Yes, I do. Yes. And so I, I guess I'll speak about that for a few minutes. Um, firstly, I'll relay a quick anecdote from the beginning of my mission, just to illustrate. And not all missionaries go on a mission and come from a place of, you could say, perfect innocence, but do realize that they are often 18 to 21 year old kids, essentially. They've just finished high school. Now, I have met some missionaries who are very well educated, even at that age and quite mature. Um, but just to illustrate, when I was a missionary in my first area, I was walking around speaking with people one day and uh, I spoke with this old guy. He had this really good looking beard and uh, he approached me and he just asked me this simple question. He said, have you read Darwin? Mm -hmm. And I said, who's Darwin? <laughs> and I, I think that I, well, to this day, I've never forgotten that question. And so just the, the simple direct challenge, and I'll never meet this man again. I'll probably, I don't even remember him. I'll never see him again. But the fact that he asked me that question made a difference to me because it revealed to me later on when I found out who Darwin was, I'm like, how could I not who, know who Darwin was? Of course, he looked very much like Darwin. I wonder if he had some other implication with that. But uh, yes, so that that's uh, just to illustrate, I think there is some benefit in direct challenges. So here are some questions. Firstly, I want to point out that missionaries have a strict code of what kinds of content they can and cannot consume in terms of reading. So there's no point uh, or almost no point 
in printing out something and giving it to them and saying, hey, I think you should read this information about Joseph Smith. Uh, people did that to me on my mission and I just threw it away because they're not allowed to consume that kind of content. So it's, it's part of the rule book. So there's probably little or no value. You might find the occasional missionary who would be willing to read through that and it would challenge them, but most often that would not be the case. So my suggestion is to ask them thoughtful but not antagonistic questions about LDS doctrine and uh, practices. So I, I've put these into two categories. The first one are social issues, which are a bit softer. And the second are doctrinal issues, which are far more direct. So I'm just going to give a sample of some of the types of questions you could ask in both categories, starting off with social issues. Uh, the first question you could ask them is, why does your church spend so much money on temples or buildings or missionaries to spread the gospel that th they want to spread, but doesn't spend as much money on uh, charity? for example, the, the percentage of revenue, as far as I understand, there's the other church does not disclose its financials, but people have extrapolated this. The percentage of revenue that the LDS church spends on charity is quite low compared to the amount they spend on other things directly related to their work. So, and if you want a little tool, uh, I know LDS scriptures very well. So there's a, in the Book of Mormon, which is a book that they use, there is a scripture, 2 Nephi 28, 13, which speaks about this kind of behavior. So you could say, look, I'm a bit confused because your own scriptures speak about not building fine sanctuaries and, and treating the poor in a bad way, but the LDS church itself does exactly that. The second question in the area of social issues, which is just a very straightforward, simple question, is to ask them, about why Mormonism is so small. I mean, you could ask them if Mormonism is so important to God, if it's so important for him to work out the salvation of mankind through this belief system, then why let only 0.02% of the world's population be involved in it? There are 15 million Mormons in the world that, that's on record, and probably about a third of those are actually active or practicing. So it's really just, a matter of if it's so important and if, if it's such a big deal for God, then why are there so few people who adhere to it? It's a very simple question. Another question you could ask them is about if they know about Joseph Smith's polygamy, which means he married multiple women, and or his polyandry, which is not only did he marry multiple women, but he married other people's wives. In fact, in one case, or, or I think a few cases, he even sent a person on a mission and then married their wife while that person was away on their mission. You might be able to tie that up with the girlfriend question <laughs> because uh, one of the questions earlier is about girlfriends. So how would you feel? You could ask these two in tandem. You could say, how would you feel if your best friend married your girlfriend while you were on a mission? Question A. Question B, did you know that Joseph Smith did just that? <laughs> so that, that is an interesting approach to that. Um, and even though they might do another thing, they might go away and research it, huh? Correct, yes. Because these are the kinds of things that have been buried through the, the whitewashing and correlation of the LDS Church over over a hundred years. So these are things that kids grow up in the LDS Church, they don't know it at all. Like someone can be 50 years old in the LDS Church and never know that Joseph Smith did that, being a member their whole life. So it's definitely something you can point out. And, and invite them to research it. Tell them you're not just making it up. Go look it up. Uh, so finally, this is one trick that you can play, which I've thought of. I've never played it. If someone does this, please tell me. I would love to know the reaction that comes to this. So just for a bit of history, and, and again, the more knowledgeable one is about LDS doctrine and issues, the better one can negotiate with missionaries and, and sort of ask these interesting questions. And one of them is, and, and I, again, I challenge someone to try this out. Take the name Fanny Elger, F-A-N-N-Y-A-L-G-E-R. Missionaries have pass along cards, those little cards that they give you that has, you know, do you want your family to be together forever, that kind of thing. Just mm -hmm. write down the name Fanny Elger on the pass along card and your phone number and say to them, if you go find out who this person is, 
then I'm happy to have a chat with you. Of course, this is sort of a bait. You're saying you can you can teach me, but first I want you to know who this person is. Now, Fanny Alger was Joseph Smith's first plural wife, and she was 14 at the time they got married. So if any missionary, and, and the only place they could find out this kind of information because they're not allowed to Google or anything, would be their mission president, which is the local ecclesiastical leader of the mission. So what you could say is, I want you to go to your mission president and find out who Fanny Elger is. And once you've done that, have a chat with me. And, and that is just a very, very quick and direct way to expose someone to very fundamental issues with LDS Church. Just a single name and say, you look this up and we'll talk. So, Sean, what about questions concerning doctrine, specifically contradictions within Mormon doctrine? Would you bring that up? Absolutely, and I think this is an area where the more knowledge you have about such contradictions, the better equipped you'll be to approach such questions. So firstly, I want to do a quick plug. Uh, there are hundreds uh, of contradictions in LDS doctrine, and a lot of these are sort of buried underneath the standard narrative. But there's a document, if you are really interested in, in having a lot of knowledge in this area, there's a document called the CES Letter. If you just Google CES Letter, uh, there's a document written by an ex-Mormon wherein he writes his questions and concerns about LDS truth claims. So this, this document has literally, uh, I think, almost 100 questions that are detailed and very difficult to answer if you're a, a believer. And uh, it's, it, there is so much detail in there, we don't have time, obviously, to go through all of it. But some of the things I'll mention are from there. You could pick any random question out there, and, and you could pick a different one on a different day if they keep coming back to your door. But I'll speak about some specific doctrinal concerns. Again, referring back to my statement, you can't give them something for them to take away and read. So really, all you have is your conversation right then and there. They won't go back and research anything you ask, unless maybe the Fanny Alger, if you ask that very small, specific question. So let's go through a couple of things that you could do in real time with a missionary. The first is, I found this very interesting scriptural contradiction in LDS scripture. Um, the LDS church has two scriptures outside of the Bible, two sets of scriptures. One is the Book of Mormon, and one is the Doctrine and Covenants. They have others, but those are two big ones. And in the Book of Mormon, there's a scripture, Jacob 2.24, uh, which says, Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. So David and Solomon having concubines and wives, bad. God doesn't like it. Then if you go to Doctrine and Covenants 132.39, it says, David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me by the hand of Nathan, my servant, and others of the prophets who had the keys of his power. So this is one of the more beautiful direct contradictions. And I've read apologetics about this specific question and it is really, really complicated mental gymnastics. Um, but definitely that's something that you could point out is these two specific scriptures. And you could ask them, hey, because the missionary most often would be unprepared for that kind of question. You ask them, hey, what about these two? And often missionaries carry the scriptures around with them. So you could, you, you could just ask them, hey, I want you to open up to this one. I want you to open up to this one. What about that? And that would be a very difficult, it's a very direct challenge, but I think it would be interesting and would make them think. So aside from that direct contradiction that you could point out, you could also tell them that you want to invite them over to your house to study Doctrine and Covenants section 132. Now, modern Mormons are monogamous, meaning they don't have multiple wives, but it's of LDS doctrine that polygamy is not only permissible, but important and it's still in the formal canon of scripture. So if you sit together with them and read Doctrine and Covenants 132, just read the whole chapter, it's pretty long, but uh, there's a lot of stuff in there about women 
uh, specifically Joseph Smith's first wife, Emma, uh, being destroyed if she doesn't follow this commandment of polygamy. So these are interesting things that you can just point out. And as you know, with many religions, the whole milk before meat thing applies. So most often they will introduce the nice, gentle things first. But if you just skip ahead straight to the difficult stuff, then it can kind of shake them up and make them think about that. So another one, and I think this is the most important, I've, I've kept the best for last. Part of the fundamental sort of approach to truth claims of the LDS Church is that one has to pray to God to know whether or not the Book of Mormon is true. And if one receives a witness from the Holy Ghost, then that's a testimony that it is true. Now, there's abundant evidence that there are other religions who do the same thing and or other religions who may not explicitly claim that, but their adherents pray to God to know if the religion is true and they receive affirmative answers. So it's, it's an interesting challenge and it's something that is unreconcilable in Mormon doctrine because there's such a reliance on this spiritual witness. So I would, you know, the most simple, most straightforward argument you can raise is, or you could even say it yourself, if, if you are religious and, and you feel this way, you could say, I've prayed about the Book of Mormon and God told me that's not true. And there is literally no reconciliation of that answer. It's a very direct approach. So again, uh, those are just a sample of some of the issues. If you want to see some more, I'd suggest go to the CES letter if you want a list if you want a bit more ammunition, but we don't have time to go over all of those today. Okay, Sean, that is a really fascinating insight into the, the mind of a Mormon missionary and how we can go about challenging them and making them think. So thanks again. Thank you so much for talking with us and we wish you all the best in your life out of Mormonism and as an activist. Thank you. Take care.